We stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Mr. Chair. Approval of the county board minutes. So moved. Second. I got a motion, a second. Any more discussion? If not, those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Any additions or deletions? Yeah, agenda you have in front of you is correct. All right, I need a motion, please. So moved. Second? Second. Any more discussion? If not, those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Land services. Who do we have here today? Good morning. Good morning. Our friends from land services here today. Could you state your names for the record, please? Uh. Uh. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Amy. All right. Um, we have um, just one item for you today, and that is to uh, discuss the recommendation of the Aquatic Invasive Species Grant Committee. Um, that is made up of myself and Galen and Commissioners Wilson and Lemire. Uh, we, as you know, we budget every year for an Aquatic Invasive Species Grant that goes out to lake associations and lake improvement districts for work, Aquatic Invasive Species work on their individual lakes. Um, we did receive several applications for grant money this year and we met as a committee and reviewed those we also did review that uh, in respect to compatibility with our aquatic invasive species plan and we have the committee came up with a recommendation for funding that was part of your packet you should have a sheet that has the um, the, app, the list of the applicants, what they requested, the summary of their projects, and then what the um, group ultimately recommended. And so I'll let Galen um, kind of expand on that a little bit. Uh, yeah, so the first one there, I'm going to receive an application from Sullivan. They're planning on doing an ambassador program as well as an aquatic invasive species treatment, which is something we had opened up for them this year. Um, uh, they are asking for $15,000, and we're recommending 13656 Alexander, Crookneck, Shamina, and Fish Trap are asking to do, are proposing to do an AIS detection survey, um, treatment of AIS, as well as they're starting the ambassador program as well, which is great. Now we have um, two groups that are doing that, which are covering a five-lake um, set of lakes there. Um, we're recommending... 45,548, so less than what they're, re they're requested. Um, Green Prairie is planning or asking to do, proposing to do a chemical treatment of curly leaf pondweed, um, as well as they're planning on getting a bunch of aquatic invasive species education materials. And they're going to be doing presentations at their annual meetings, as well as sending out um, documentation to lakeshore owners. Um, they're requesting 5,000, and we're recommending $3,656. Pine Cedar Lakes, they're proposing to do an early AS detection survey, um, zebra mussel settling plates, as well as doing some AS educational um, brochures and handouts, and then a curly leaf pondweed um, spring boundary survey, and that's for future treatment purposes. And they're requesting 4,400, or sorry, 4,043, and we're recommending that amount. Um, kind of how we broke that up is um, we tried to grant or recommend um, the total amount for non-treatment projects and then with the remainder we just split that up among the people that requested treatment and that's why you'll see for instance on Sullivan they ask for 15,000 and we're recommending 13,656 so you know the 10,000 that would go towards the ambassador program would be covered and then the remainder of that would go towards their treatment program. As you can see, we had we had requests more requests than we had dollars, so we did have we were not able to fully fully grant all of these requests. So we had to make some decisions there. We also realized that um, the treatment five thousand dollars towards treatment isn't going to cover the total cost of treatment. So we felt giving um, equally distributing the the leftover money for treatment um, was certainly a step in the right direction, knowing that. Um, um, that full ask wasn't going to cover it anyway. So um, that is that is the recommendation of the um, 
of the committee that we had a total available of $66,903, and we're looking to grant $66,903. Gentlemen, I'll look for a motion for more discussion. I'll make that motion. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Any more discussion? Mr. Chair, I have a question, and the question is, I think I know the answer, but can you explain the Boat Landing Ambassador Program? I believe I know what that is, but if you could. Sure, yeah, so there's, there's kind of two um, avenues that individuals can get involved in addressing people showing up to the lake with their um, boating equipment and having it inspected. One is actually an inspector where you're, um, you're going through a checklist and you're, you're either stopping them from going in the lake or helping them um, get to a point where they can go into the lake. The ambassador program is more of a stewardship where you're, um, you're communicating with them, you're encouraging them to make sure they're, they're removing all the aquatic invasive species off their boat. They can't stop them from going into the lake. Um, they can be a, a point or a source of um, communication with the DNR if they recognize a boat that's going in with a bunch of aquatic invasive species. But it's a little softer touch. Um, so Sullivan, this is their second year doing this. And um, they, they've kind of established um, that they're they're kind of the face of their lake, and so they, they've got jumper cables, they've got things to help people out just in general, as well as communicate an EAS a message. Um, but they're not there to, you know, um, they're not inspectors, they're not there to stop people from going into the lake. But um, they are trained by the DNR. Right. So and they're obviously not there every day. They not must every day. They must pick, I'm anticipating active weekends or supposed active, active weekends. <laughs> To be holidays, yeah. holidays. Yeah, and they holidays. actually outlined in their um, proposal or their their application. They're planning on 40 days with a total of 648 hours of coverage. Thank you. Any more discussion, gentlemen? If not, I have a motion and a second. This will be a roll call vote. Commissioner Lemire. Aye. Commissioner Wilson. Aye. Commissioner Jelinski. Aye. Commissioner Blaine. Aye. Myself. Aye. Motion carried. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Okay. Public hearing. Have a good week, you guys. Thanks, you too. Thanks, you Thank you. Morning, Steve. Good morning, Mr. Morning. Chairman, members of the board. Good morning. A lot of action today. Yes, I see you have quite a bit for us. Mr. Chairman, the first. Uh, Action is a request for the board to adopt a change in our solid waste ordinance. When our solid waste ordinance was originally um, contemplated, it was intended that there were two options for disposal. One would be that it would be delivered to the Morrison County landfill. The other, in order to comply with interstate commerce, would be that you could deliver it outside the state of Minnesota. As time has gone on, um, more regulations have been put in place, more abilities to test at lower levels. Um, our permits have changed, which results in situations where we may not be able to, to take solid waste generated in Morrison County at the landfill, but it could possibly be disposed of at another facility in the state of Minnesota. So included in the ordinance is a solid waste service fee that generates monies for us to clean up the old landfill, household hazardous waste programs, recycling programs, that helps fund that. And so the way that is paid is if you are a licensed hauler, you have a account at the landfill, you deliver solid waste to the landfill, um, the tip fee that you have there is split between the solid waste service fee and the tip fee. If you are a self hauler, it's the same thing. When you deliver it to our landfill, the, the fee that you paid is split between the solid waste service fee and the tip fee. If you delivered it outside of the, Minas the state of Minnesota, which our ordinance contemplated, you would just pay the service fee. There's a reporting mechanism in the ordinance that required you to do that, and that's how we collected the service fee. But since you were not disposing at our facility, you didn't pay that portion of the tip fee. What this does, though, is now it will it, it will incorporate that, that if it, materials go outside the state of Minnesota, but if it goes to another facility within the state of Minnesota, you still would be responsible to pay the solid waste service fee. And that's what this language is for. So. Gentlemen, any more discussion? We'll be opening this up for the public at this time, and I'll... Uh, 
ask three times if anybody has any comment or question to the Steve or to the board. So this will be the first time. Do I have any comment or question from the public? This will be the second time. Any comment or questions from the public? And the third and final time, any questions or comments from the public? We'll close the public hearing at this time. Gentlemen, still any more uh, questions regarding the resolution? Mr. Chair, just so you know, I didn't get any mail-in correspondence. I assume Stevie didn't either. We did not have any contact on this um, public hearing or this change in the ordinance at the department up until this morning. Yeah. All right. Okay. Mr. Chair, just a question, if I may. We, I, I'm very clear, and, and I believe everyone is clear on our solid waste goes to the landfill. That, that's a given. Is there very much that actually goes out of state? No. Okay. It doesn't happen very often. Okay. Can you give me an example on any kind of garbage, whatever it might be, that would go out of state? Um, there, could, there could be, it, it's probably more uh, that it would go to another facility in the state than maybe going out of state where uh, the toxicity level of materials exceed what our permit allows and we can't take it at our facility, but a incinerator could accept it. That would be a situation where Perfect. it would go to another location, but they'd still have to pay the service fee. Thank you. And this eliminates that just that option of going out of state. It's any landfill within the state of Minnesota, also, correct? Yes. If it goes, the, it, the there are other requirements in our ordinance that they'd have to follow. So it, it may have to go to our facility. If we can accept it, our, our, our the system is set up so that it, if it's generated in our county and we can accept it at our landfill, it it needs to go there. Mm -hmm. Correct. And so and. It's a, if there's a hazardous waste in there that our landfill cannot take, then we right. allow them to go somewhere else to uh, dispose of it, and then we get their, the fee. We get, we get a service fee to help pay for, like I said, remediation of the old landfill is what those revenues go for. That's why it was built into the ordinance originally. Okay. All right, gentlemen, I'll need a motion. I'll make a motion to approve, Mr. In a second. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any more discussion? If not, those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Thanks, Steve. Now you got a few other things. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, uh, item number two is the distribution of the town road allotment. Um, each year we certify town road mileage to the state of Minnesota. <clears throat> that town road mileage compared with all the town road mileage in the state, uh, determines our allotment. Then the allotment that uh, we receive is distributed to our townships based on 50% on their mileage and 50% on their population. The spreadsheet was provided to the board. Um, we're requesting that you would uh, authorize us to make this distribution to the townships. I'll move on that, Mr. Chair. I'll second. second. Any more discussion? Not those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, the next uh, several items are the culmination of a uh, number of discussions we've had about our 2019 transportation improvement program. Uh, most of our work is being uh, driven by pavement preservation type work uh, that we're presenting here today. And so the first, the first contract is contract 283. Could we go to the next? It is for County State 8 Highway 39. Roll that up. Sorry. Okay, I'm sorry running from uh, piers to what is called the maintenance line with Mille Lacs County. That's uh, we, th those last two miles on the east, east end there. Uh, one mile is ours and one mile is Mille Lacs County. This uh, funding for this is a, it is a, a resurfacing project uh, on the east end. We will we'll be milling and uh, re resurfacing, but from that would be from 33 East, but from 33 to Piers, that's a simple overlay job. The funding, main funding source for this uh, is federal transportation funds that we were successful in obtaining through the Region 5 process. And we received four proposals for the work with Knife River <clears throat> uh, being the low apparent bidder at $1,552,478.80. Uh, 
our recommendation is that you would award this contract to Knife River. Gentlemen, I have, so I have a motion. I need a second. Second. Any more discussion? Not. Those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Let the me interrupt. That was a roll call. I guess these next three will probably be the roll Oops. call. So I'm sorry. Commissioner Wilson. Aye. Commissioner Blaine. Aye. Commissioner Jelinski. Aye. Commissioner LaMere. Aye. Myself. Aye. Motion carried. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, the next item is for contract 284, which includes a, a thin resurfacing of our county state aid highway 8 between Casaw 39 and trunk highway 27 in Lee Township. Also included in this contract is our county state aid highway 33. We have this is a little bit of an odd one, but the reason this is being done this way from 113th to just short of 39, that little piece on the end, uh, we re replaced major center line culverts throughout 33 a couple years ago. The materials that were removed from the center of the road as a part of those installations was used to shoulder widen this stretch of road. That last quarter mile on the north end was, a, was built across a very low swampy area. That was all excavated at the time that the culvert work was done. So that was completed at that point in time. So those four miles have, meet current design standards and now we're gonna do the pavement rehabilitation on it. So this one uh, is gonna be full depth reclamation. We will mill the surface off and we'll come in, grind it up. There's gonna be a small amount of cement that'll be mixed into the surfacing before paving takes place to stabilize that. Um, so that's what that project will consist of. Our county state aid highway 41 is a a resurfacing project that will bring that up to a 10 ton uh, spring load carrying capacity. Our, our county road 239 is the, the completion of this one mile that we graded last year. Uh, the initial bituminous surfacing will take place this spring and this contract will be the final bituminous surfacing on that one mile. Also along with this is our County Road 251. That's the piece that runs in front of uh, the County Highway shop, the Piers shop, uh, just uh, on the outer edges of Piers. That'll be a full depth reclamation, stabilized and then resurfaced. So we received proposals for this work. Those, the abstract of bids are included in your packet. And again, we received four proposals for this work and Knife River Corporation, again, was the low bidder at $2,231,614.11. It's our recommendation that we accept the low bid of Knife River. Gentlemen, I'll ask for a motion. So move. I have a motion and a second. Any more discussion? Again, this will be a roll call vote. Commissioner Lemire? Aye. Commissioner Wilson? Aye. Commissioner Blaine? Aye. Commissioner Jelinski? Aye. Myself? Aye. Motion carried. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, then our final contract today is contract 385. It includes County State Aid Highway 1 between Trunk Highway 27 and the city of Randall. Steve, just for the record, is it 385 or 285? Oh, I'm sorry, 285. This is, uh, we'll be uh, milling the uh, uh, inch and a half of bituminous off of the surface, and then we will be coming back, we'll uh, come back with a tight pave and a new bituminous wear, uh, and then aggregate shouldering throughout that entire length. The second project is our county state aid highway 11. This is right. And uh, this project uh, in, will be, we will mill off of the bituminous surface. We will have full depth reclamation on County State at Highway 11, uh, except through some of the low weak swamp areas, we'll uh, leave the existing bituminous in those locations to keep the strength there to build across those uh, swamp areas. Then tight pave and bituminous overlay the, uh, uh, the rest of the roadway. 
Also then is County, County Road 217, which is a simple tight pave to get uh, uh, the ride back into it and uh, build up some of the strength for uh, spring load carrying capacity. And the same with our County Road 218. We received proposals and the abstract of bids uh, were included in your packet. There were four proposals submitted with Anderson Brothers Construction submitting the low proposal at $3,494,646.15. And it's our recommendation that we award this contract to Anderson Brothers. So move, Mr. Chair. I have a Chair. motion. I need a second. Aye. Any more discussion, gentlemen? Not again. This is a roll call vote. Commissioner Blaine? Aye. Commissioner Jelinski? Aye. Commissioner Lemire? Aye. Commissioner Wilson? Aye. Myself? Aye. Motion carried. Mr. Chair, if I may, uh, Steve, uh, uh, these projects are all projects that will be uh, started on and, and worked on this summer, correct? Yes, yes okay. they are. Yes. Okay. They're all ready to go. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, the next item is a request to uh, enter into a sponsorship agreement with the City of Piers in order for the City of Piers to make a local road improvement program grant for uh, the reconstruction of Centennial Drive. Uh, local road improvement program is funded by bond mon monies through the state of Minnesota. It's a program that is open to townships and small cities, but in order for those entities to apply, they either have to have a county sponsor them or a city of over 5,000 population. In this situation, uh, Centennial Drive, the City of Piers had requested uh, consideration from the county that we were unable to uh, take that over or, or assist them, I think, in, in moving a project forward. So they're looking to find some additional support for this. And so what we, what, what, the way we've done that is we've entered into agreement which lays out the terms and conditions of our sponsorship. So after the, if you adopt this agreement, we'll pass a resolution that uh, we will sponsor the project, but this agreement really lays out the cost and puts the cost burden on the city of Piers if they want to move this project forward. This is the same funding source that we were successful on for the airport road extension that we're moving forward on with that project, which was a joint effort between Little Falls Township and City of Little Falls. Um, but this is, an, this is a, a project that uh, the City of Piers wants to move forward on, on their own. And uh, our recommendation is that we would support this. It, it, it fits well with the overall transportation system in that area. Um, in, the, in the agreement, you'll see that we do provide, as a county, the administrative services. It's a relatively minor cost to us in order for a good project to get done by one of our small cities. So, Gentlemen, I'll ask for a motion. I'll make a motion. I have a motion. I need a second. Second. Any more discussion? If not, those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, uh, then the next resolution is the resolution in which we actually agree to sponsor the local road improvement project for the city of Piers for the reconstruction of Centennial Drive. Gentlemen, I'll ask for a motion. I'll make that motion. Second. And I have a motion and a second. Any more discussion? If not, those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, last week we uh, had a good meeting I think, with the district traffic engineer and the assistant district traffic engineer, representatives of the city of Randall, relative to the concerns of the high accident frequency on the segment of US Highway 10 through the city of Randall. We talked about a number of different options and safety strategies to work towards trying to reduce that accident frequency through that corridor. What we're asking for the board to do is authorize this resolution of support for us to continue to try and build public or public consensus, including public participation of, uh, of residents in the city of Randall for what's uh, called, what's, what's known as the reduced conflict intersections. Um, we had the opportunity to see how those worked. 
Um, I, I guess the real professionals that have been dealing with this are telling us this is the this is the proper solution for this situation. And so we're requesting that the board adopt the resolution to show support that we would uh, begin a process of of some public meetings to inform folks of what's going to happen up there if this goes through. And then with the board's participation in that or report back to you on how that turns out as we then if uh, d decide that that's how we want to try to resolve this, we would apply and work with MnDOT to obtain funding to, to do a project through this corridor. Make a motion to approve. I have a motion. I need a second. Okay. I have a motion and a second. Any more discussion? I would just like to say thanks to Steve for setting up that meeting with the state of Minnesota and the uh, city councilman and the mayor of Randall. It, it, they are dangerous intersections. It's it's proven their their risk factors are above what a, a warning yes. number is. They're instead of a one, they're a 1.3, and uh, something needs to be done there because too many people are getting injured on them two intersections. So appreciate it. And I got to agree with you. Their information was unbelievable. I mean, they had statistics there for us, so I was very impressed. So thanks, Steve. Steve, Mr. Chair, just for the sake of argument, if this project was to go forth and uh, start as soon as possible, we're probably about three years away from actually starting construction. Or MnDOT would be is that is that that's kind of what I got out of the meeting. Would that be about there, right? There are, I think that um, with MnDOT leading the project and the way their program is set up, that probably is the the fastest schedule that we could would you know could put in place. There are some other options where we could uh, be the lead on the project with MnDOT supporting the funding sources and uh, to pay for it. That probably could accelerate it some. Um, I guess that, that'll be part of what we kind of work through as sure. we try to develop this. Gentlemen, any more discussion? Not those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Motion carried. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Then my, my final uh, action item, Mr. Um, Chairman, is a detour agreement. Now, the city of Little Falls and MnDOT will be reconstructing Trunk Highway 27. Uh, through, the, through the city of Little Falls. For that portion of the construction project west of the river, um, MnDOT is proposing to utilize several of our county roads for a detour during that construction. Um, county Road, at the intersection of County uh, Road 214, 238, and Trunk Highway 27, uh, beginning at that point, going north, and then it, it, it turns to the east, that County Road 214 would be a part of the detour. It then crosses over Old Highway 10, R52, uh, and the BNSF Railroad tax. There's a short segment of that, of County State 8 Highway 13, that would then be the detour. Then it comes back south to Trunk Highway 27 on our County Road 213. Um, this agreement lays out the terms and conditions and the um, reimbursement that we will receive for MnDOT to carry their traffic on our roadways. Our recommendation is that you adopt this detour agreement uh, so that it can be put in place during construction. So moved, I have Chair. a motion. I need a second. Second. Any more discussion? Question, do they have an idea how long this uh, will take? Uh, it, it says, I think, October 1st. Um, I know that they want to have the majority of it done by the time they have the, the uh, craft fair event in town. So there will be cleanup and some maintenance activities that will take place, I suspect, after that time period is, is reached. Thank you. Any more discussion? Not those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. That's all I have, Mr. Chairman. Thanks a lot, Steve. Thank have a good day. Thanks, Steve. Good day. Thank you. Yeah, you <laughs> won't see me for a while. Yeah. <laughs> Sheriff's report. Oh, next month. <laughs> Morning, Sheriff. Morning, Sheriff. Morning, Sheriff. Morning, Mr. Chair, members Morning, of the board. Morning, Sheriff. Morning. <laughs> it's always a challenge to get into this chair. Part of it's my own fault, and some of it's the equipment. So. <laughs> we'll blame it all on the equipment. So we'll be going through the monthly report for January um, of 2019. As always, I usually start with a couple photos. Um, 
This, this photo that's being displayed on the screen, this was our 46th rec weekend, uh, rec standing for residents encountering Christ. Um, there's a couple of people who have been prior inmates. The rest of the people there were uh, basically uh, volunteers from our community that come in and help with our, our inmates during this uh, weekend. This weekend was the 12th and 13th of January. We had approximately 44 volunteers. Um, since our jail administrators here and our jail programmer, uh, Scott McKissick and Tim Brummer, I want to say thanks to them. And, and the, the things I'm hearing in the community is that the volunteers are being welcomed into our jail with open arms, and that's huge. And I think that's it helps make makes the weekend a lot easier. Um, and then it's uh, it's word of mouth as well. When we have half of our inmates attending this program over that weekend, that means a lot as well. So, so yeah, it was a good weekend, and um, I think everyone did a great job. Uh, the second picture, this was just Law Enforcement Appreciation Day. Um, Hands of Hope recognized our law enforcement agency, and they uh, brought us a few snacks. And I. I think I ate the whole plate, but I may have saved one or two cookies for everyone else. <laughs> Maybe that is attributing to the chair problem. Exactly. <laughs> and then if you don't mind opening up an email that I sent that's not part of this packet, we'll talk a little bit about the Peers Active Shooter Scenario. So we're going to be sharing a few photos. This first photo is just a, um, we utilized a drone. The active shooter scenario kind of went into a uh, barricaded subject. In other words, there was no longer a threat um, to any of the students. However, the suspect was barricaded in one of the rooms. So we deployed a drone, and the drone is actually displaying a picture of a couple of victims who are laying on the uh, floor with their backs against the lockers. And then you can see one of the deputies who's um, kind of in that door entryway looking down the hallway. And it's important to point out this is some technology that we're, um, we use for a lot of different circumstances. This is the first time we used it in a school setting. And um, it worked very well. And then in the incident command post, we had a big screen TV. So when you got all the incident commanders, i.e. the superintendent of the school, the EMS um, personnel, the, first, uh, the person in charge of the fire department, myself, um, and all these other incident commanders sitting around, we're able to see this shot of the drone that's on the screen in our command post at live time. Um, there was, I believe... Oh, I'm sorry, do you want me to keep going or not? Yeah, yeah if okay. you don't mind, just go back to that. Go back to it? So this is a... That Burn. one's a... <laughs> we'll wait to see what picture comes up. This one? Next do you want to go to the next one? Sure. Okay. <laughs> This is the, I'm just going in order she sent them to me. What yep. do you want to, okay. This will work. All right. So this is, you can see the fire department's working on one of the victims. We call it three echo training, something we just started implementing with our fire departments that we're going to be reaching out to our other fire departments in within Morrison County. And what this is, is once that the threat has been stabilized and or pinned down and or neutralized, and there's no longer a threat to these students who have been hurt in the process, then we will be going in, we be in law enforcement, we'll be escorting the fire department and or first responders to these victims and getting them back to safety where EMS can work on them. And then they can determine, A, are they gonna um, load these victims up by ground ambulance or are they gonna have a, get medevac out from the scene. So that's what's going on there. And you can see that she's holding a little placard. Basically, it states the injuries. So when the fire department personnel get there, they have to determine, okay, where are you at? Do you need to get, go over here or do you need to go over here to get immediately worked on? Can you walk to the ambulance? You know, what are your injuries? And that's what that card shows. This is our drone operator. So this is a somebody actually taking a picture of the drone and you can see our drone operator in the background. This is the smaller drone that gets utilized for training purposes uh, to become a drone operator and also for building searches, which we're conducting here. This is uh, one half or one portion of our incident command post. You can see Jane Holman and I think Doug Rexted in the background. 
basically they are they took over this scenario Jane did and our 911 dispatchers all the communication for this scenario flowed through them um, through our through our uh, through Jane doing the dispatching and everything she's typing came back up on our screen on the incident command site so we knew if we didn't hear it we can physically see what's going on So this is a picture of a lot of the incident commanders. Um, you got the Pierce Fire Department, you got uh, EMS, you have myself, you have uh, Emily from uh, uh, Public Health, you have uh, George Weber from uh, the Pierce Superintendent of the school, and then you had a uh, female subject there who worked for the Pierce uh, IT department. In the, in the background, you can kind of see the screen I was talking about, where we could see live time what was happening. Um, one screen, you could see what was going on with the drone and what the operator was seeing. The other screen that we can't see is uh, multiple cameras from the school that we interfaced onto our computer system. So we could see multiple hallways and we could see where the suspect was going at all times. I think that was just a fancy photo I was going to share. I don't know if there's any other ones. Okay. So basically, um, the whole Pierce School District staff participated in this. They had uh, uh, teachers and staff from Holy Trinity, Pioneer Elementary, and then of course the Pierce Healy High School. I believe they had 120 staff members. Um, that were involved in this, and then they had we had approximately 10 to 12 students who were uh, role players in this incident as well. Um, of course, with anything, we do a debriefing at the end. We try and figure out you know, what went good, what needs work. And uh, one of the things that we, we came up with, with was the radio communication. Um, we found some faulty areas in the school where we're having issues communicating back and forth, so that's huge for us. So that's being addressed. Um, they're gonna have a radio company come in and do an assessment, and then uh, they'll be making recommendations to the school, and of course, we're gonna be working with the school on that as well. And then the biggest thing is pre-planning, which we wanna do before we do any exercise, and which we wanna do throughout any school in our district is bring all the players to the table and start talking about the scenario itself because there's gonna be a lot of questions that arise that we can figure out during the pre-planning and that we wanna figure out before a large scale event like this even occurs. So any questions regarding that? Mr. Chair? Sheriff, we certainly hope that nothing like this ever happens without a doubt. However, and Pretty cool stuff here. I love the technology piece, and I really like the piece where you can tie into the local school's camera system. My question is, we can do it in Piers. Can we do it in Little Falls? Can we do it in Swanville? Can we do it in Upsala Royalton? I don't know if I missed anybody. Motley. Pardon? Motley. Motley. Can we tie their camera system in to our camera system and get the same result? So what we do is we have Doug Rexted, who's kind of our technology geek, yep. if you will, on the Morrison County end of it, Sheriff's Office, he's reaching out to these schools because there is software that has to be downloaded. And we want to make sure we can do that and have the right passwords before an event like this happens. So yes. yes. Very good. Thank you very much. Anything else, gentlemen? Okay. So going through our monthly report, I'll kind of just skip and, and highlight some of the stuff. Uh, if you go down to the training, um, you can see 18 officers attended active shooter training. That was the incident in Piers. So what we did was we utilized deputies who were already on the clock and working, and then this was a SWAT team exercise as well. So they got credit for training, and that's how we came up with a total number of 18. If I may, Mr. Chair, you allow like the city of Little Falls Police Department, city of Piers, to be involved in these two? Absolutely. In this case, actually, it was uh, uh, the police chief, Eric Kennekin, that did all the preparation on this. Um, and then, of course, we have members of uh, our SWAT team that belong to Little Falls Police Department, so yes. Um, and then we attended, uh, 18 officers attended tactical search training. And that what that is, we utilized the shoot house at Camp Ripley, and we just practiced doing our entries. And then, uh, of course, we're responding to different targets, whether they're uh, good guy, bad guy, shoot, no shoot scenarios, things like that. 
Um, we'll go to our criminal complaints. And just to highlight the criminal complaints, there's 80 of them for the month of January. Um, if you look at the three o'clock position or between the two and three o'clock, it's traffic. It's kind of an orange colored, it's 9%. We had seven traffic uh, criminal complaints and what that is, most of them were just driving after revocation, driving after suspension. They turned into a criminal, normally it's just a misdemeanor, it's a payable fine. But these are the ones where we run into people multiple times, um, they don't learn their lesson, they, their history shows that they failed to appear for court. So what we do is we run into them, we look at their record and we're like, nope, you need to go to jail. That's the only way you're gonna learn. So that's what that is. Um, if you follow this down to the 11% at the four o'clock position, um, that's gonna be, oh, what do I got here? That's gonna be our disturbing the peace. Um, if you see the next one in the uh, seven o'clock position, that's gonna be 15%. That's gonna be our um, damage to property. This includes uh, mailbox, uh, vandalism, uh, four vandalism damage to properties from a yard and three from a vehicle and two street signs. And then the 21% up in the 11 o'clock position, that's our scams and our fraud that we continually deal with on a monthly basis. That's anything from social security scams to grandparent scam to Medicare, um, publishers, clearinghouse, things like that. Any questions on that? If you move on to our traffic citations, you'll see we had 144 traffic citations. Um, the top blue portion, we had 101 verbal warnings. And then the blue quadrant on the bottom, uh, labeled 15, that was 15 speeds. And then we had 14 written warnings in the red portion of the pie. A two-year comparison, you can see pretty much everything across the board has been down, except for our total inmates was up by three. If you go over to the jail portion for the total inmates, in Morrison County, we averaged 35 inmates for the month of January. Itasca, we averaged six. And the total amount of inmates to include Morrison County as well as Ottawa County inmates was 41. Our revenue collected from out of county inmates was 18, bringing us a revenue of $10,780. I think we talked about it too, how this fluctuates. It seems like our own number was down this month and then talking to our jail administrator, he pretty much said across the state, everybody's numbers have been down. So of course that's gonna fluctuate our revenue as well. Um, and then I'll just highlight some of our drug statistics real quick and some of the things that our investigators been up to. So we did a couple talks at the Pierce Healy High School. Uh, we reached out to the ninth grade health class. There was approximately 100 students that we talked about uh, narcotics to. Um, on January 19th, we, we talked to BuzzFeed News. And I know you're gonna ask me what BuzzFeed News is, so I had to inquire this myself. It's a company, uh, they're, they're uh, National News Agency based out of Washington, D.C. They wanted to know how the opioid crisis was, how we were affected here in the rural area. So our investigator talked to them for an over an hour, talked about their prescription task force, how we have our community stakeholders that work together, and as a result, how we're seeing a decrease now with opioids. Um, we had a large scale investigation into narcotic trafficking involving methamphetamine in the Melrose area. Um, it's an ongoing investigation. Um, we, tied that into, uh, we tied that portion of the investigation into drugs that are coming across our lines into Morrison County. So it's important that we're working in this area as well. Um, just recently they recovered three pounds of methamphetamine and $6,000 in cash from one of these warrants that they did. Um, I can tell you that we've been working some more complex cases. Like last year, if you look at the statistics, I think we had 11 cases in narcotics. This month, I think we're down to five or six. 
So now that we're working more of these complex cases and we're working these different areas, that brings our number down. Which brings me in my last subject that I want to talk about. The Little Falls Police Department currently pulled their drug task force officer. Um, I questioned the chief about this. We've, we've, our departments have a good relationship. Their reasoning was they need assistance for investigative purposes. So in other words, they're taking their drug task force officer and they're utilizing that position right now for the purposes of investigating. Um, I didn't know this was gonna happen. I found out it actually occurred after we got our okay in our second position, but I made it clear that, you know, we obviously have a drug problem. That's why we're trying to focus on getting an additional officer assigned to the task force. But the chief did advise me that anytime we need this investigator or assistance with uh, narcotic um, crimes or investigations that are going on in the city, he would provide an officer to assist us. He also made it very clear that he is going to try and um, make sure that there's not a void for too long and hopefully we'll be able to get somebody back here within the next year. So just wanted to be forward with the board about that and let the board know what's going on and what I found out about it. I think that's all I have unless have there's more discussion. questions for me. I, again, with this uh, investigator from the Drug Task Force for the City of Little Falls, so that means our the Sheriff's Department will be a little bit more involved with the City of Little Falls if there's problems? Yeah, so pretty much, Mr. Chair, if there's an investigation regarding drugs in the City of Little Falls, we're going to take that information and act on it, but we'll be contacting the City of Little Falls uh, investigator if it's occurring in the city of Little Falls, and we're gonna be asking for assistance. Um, and that pretty much was guaranteed to me that that will happen until they can, um, you know, fill that void. But I guess they're hurting on investigation side of things, and he's gotta prioritize his department. And if that's where they're hurting, he needs a little bit more help until they can figure things out. But Mr. Chair, Sheriff, it would only be to assist. They're not taking any leads uh, as a lead agency or anything like that. It is strictly, at this point in time, to assist your agency or the task force agency, rather, um, in the investigation. Yep. So you're correct, Commissioner. They, they're pulling that position off the drug task force. But if there's an investigation that occurs, let's say it's a purchase of narcotics, um, let's say we're running an informant and the checklist that we have to go through to run that informant, that's going to be solely on us. However, they would be assisting in the role of surveillance. Um, if there's a search warrant that needs to be executed, you know, based on these controlled buys, they would be um, assisting in that role as well. But correct, we would be taking the sole role. Any more discussion, gentlemen? Not, Sheriff? Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Appreciate it, Sheriff. Thank you, Sheriff. Brad, social services. Morning, Brad. Good morning, Mr. Commissioners. Give me this before I walk away with it, the signature page for the first. Again, good morning. Um, the first item that I have uh, for the board is the approval of the interlocal agreement for adult foster care licensing with Sourcewell. We have approved them to do our adult foster care licensing. We are formalizing our relationship with Sourcewell when it comes to these partnerships. Um, the cost for our agency to do adult foster care is $10,000, which is in our budget. And um, just as a, a refresher that we did repurpose the person who was a point two in adult foster care and is now doing some reimbursable services with SNBC. So I'm looking for approval. Gentlemen. Make a motion to approve. I, have a, I got second. a motion. I got a second. Any more discussion? Not those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Thank you. Then we have 
acquaint the crew with who is going to share some information on our adult mental health initiative as well as our jail re-entry program that we started in November. So Penny has choreographed this particular <laughs> presentation, so I will turn it over to her. You have choreographed this, so you can. I have choreographed this. <laughs> Sounds like you're this. in charge. <laughs> I am wonderful, Mr. Chair Penny. That doesn't mean Brummer's going to dance or anything. Does that? <laughs> <laughs> so who do you have with you, Penny? So today I brought Miss Jennifer Koenig. She is the social worker that when the board approved us to start our comprehensive re-entry program in the jail, placing a social worker physically located up there to screen for mental health and chemical dependency and provide resources and referrals. She was the chosen one and really has done just an amazing job. So I think if I can, I'll bring both Scott and Tim and everybody up and we'll kind of start with the CRE program. So not sure how it's part of that handout, but... Uh, right, so you get, no, go down. Okay. Yep, so Brad, going. could you stand up and let them sit down, please? I could. No. <laughs> <laughs> Scott might appreciate that chair better than the other one, though, so... Sure. <laughs> Just if you guys can... Yes, maybe ma'am. Um, back, back one page, I think. There. Perfect. So like I, like I was saying a little bit about our comprehensive reentry program, um, we as social workers like to have a lot of acronyms, so we formally usually are calling it the CRE program. Um, our adult mental health initiative really found a gap in services with people going into the jail, um, having mental health, chemical health, not treated, leaving the jail, reoffending going back in the jail, being arrested, going through our court system, being released, and there was this revolving door. And so as a region, our Adult Mental Health Initiative um, proposed this project really based off of the Blue Earth County's Yellow Line Project, which I'm sure you're familiar with, um, to pilot it here in our Region 5. And so we were um, awarded two different grants for this project through the Adult Mental Health Initiative, one from Sourcewell as well as one from um, Minnesota Department of Human Services Innovation Grant. Um, so through the two grants, we started piloting in Crow Wing County and now have Crow Wing County, Morrison, Aitken, all have social workers in their jails doing these screenings, um, making referrals, to services and getting people treatment to try and stop that revolving door. Um, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about the, the kind of nuts and bolts of the system and how we got here. Um, in Morrison County, in order to create our team, I put together a design team. So I pulled together Brian Mittendorf out of the county attorney's office, um, the sheriff, um, Scott out of the jail, and then we pulled together corrections, um, Center. mental health Hospital. center, yep. <clears throat> pulled everybody together for our design team to be able to say, how is this going to work for us, and how do we get you all on board? Because we can put a social worker in the jail, but if we don't have the services to refer these people out to and follow up, it, it's not going to work as efficiently as we would want it to. So from the get-go, we had a design team in board and stakeholders on board, so how are we going to model this? Um, with approval from the county board then, we were able to pilot our social worker into the jail. Miss Jennifer started in the jail on November 5th. Um, she spent that first week, went up and really modeled and shadowed in Crow Wing County as well as Aitken County so that we're providing consistent resources across our county because one thing that we know is that people are transient, right? They're not just going to stay here in Morrison County and offend. They're going to maybe live in Crow Wing County and offend and move to Morrison County and offend and, and maybe Todd County. And our region people are very transient. So this project is really looking at how can we support people getting treatment Stop the revolving door across our region. Um, so after doing that, then she really kind of kicked it off and started doing screenings. Um, she has done, in the first two and a half months since she started, she did 132 screenings for mental health and chemical health, um, which is just astronomical. I mean, I, I was just shocked at the level of skill and service that she's provided since the day that she started in that program. Um, 
There's a few that she wasn't able to do either because they refused. Those people that refused, she still had contact with them, was still able to give them resources. So they were walking out of jail with more than what they were walking into jail with. Um, overall, she met with 83% of everybody that was booked in in those first two and a half months, which is really just amazing. Um, the, the chart there, you'll see the screen's not completed. Those refusals, those are people she did still meet with, um, but they did not want that formal screening. There were two that already had services in place, and then 22 uh, people that were outside of her time that she was working. So let's say they maybe were arrested on Saturday or Sunday, arraigned right away Monday morning. She wasn't able to touch base with them, or she was off on PTO or something of that nature. The next chart that you'll see is the number of referrals made, and I think this is, um, as important as the number of screenings she's done, if not even more important, you'll see that she's made 30 referrals for people to get on medical assistance, 34 to mental health services. That could be case management, that could be an arms worker, that could be um, anything related, a therapist, psychiatry related to med uh, mental health, 44 referrals to chemical health services, Six for housing, seven for food supports, 10 for transportation, four for employment, and seven for health care. In two and a half months, this is what she's done. So I, I, again, I cannot, I cannot say enough about how well she has just taken this program and really grown it in such a short time. It's just been amazing. With that, I will turn it over to her to tell you a little bit about some of the actual success stories because I can feed you data and stats and, and numbers all day long, but what really sometimes impacts us the most is hearing about those actual stories that made a difference. Well, first I just want to say thank you to everybody for approving um, this position and your support in this because it's a really, it's a needed program. Um, some of the big things that I have helped assist with is um, individuals that come in on a probation violation, and let's say they're in outpatient treatment. Um, the treatment program doesn't always know what happens with them. Um, one individual, I was able to contact um, the treatment provider right away, and so we were able to stop transportation rides. Um, we were able to let them know, hey, she's in custody, please don't um, kick her out of the program for not coming. Um, then we were able to help her get into residential treatment. Um, and if I was not there, she would have been kicked out of treatment because they wouldn't have known where she was. Um, she would have had to have gotten another Roll 25 um, and then waited for a placement. And had I not been there, instead of her going from jail to treatment, she would have been out in the community and it would have taken her, you know, between four to six weeks to get into treatment. Um, another individual, um, it was a collaboration with a nurse, she said, hey, can you please help this person get set up with an appointment for a provider? because every time she comes in, her medical issues get worse. Um, so I met with the individual, uh, found out her insurance was ending, emailed our financial department. They said, oh, well, it is ending, but now that we know she's gonna be released, we can um, reinstate that. She didn't have to fill out any other paperwork, and then we called and scheduled an appointment with her, um, or with the medical provider um, while she was in custody. So when she left, she had an appointment. Um, Sometimes people are resistant, but there's been people who I meet with the first time and they don't even want to say more than two words, and then they come in the second time and they're willing to sit and talk to me for 20 minutes to a half an hour. So, you know, even with the little successes, they're getting used to me being there and they're more receptive to um, maybe getting the help that they need when they're released. So lots of stories. I could go on and on and on. So, Mr. Chair, can I ask a question? Jennifer, what's the most surprising or that you that's different than what you thought going into this, I guess? Um, 
I've had a lot of people say, well, I've never had to do this before. I've, I didn't have to do this the last time. Um, a lot of people have said, I really wish you would have been here when I first started getting in trouble. Um, <coughs> a lot of people are really open to meeting with me. Um, the number of refusals are really low. And let's say sometimes people refuse because most of the people that come in are high. You know, they're under the influence of something and they're not feeling well. Um, so they might say, no, I don't want to meet with you, but the longer that they're in custody, the more willing they are to meet with me. And if they're seeing other people come back down and, oh, yep, yeah, she helped me get set up with medical assistance or she helped me do this, um, they're much, much more open to, hey, can I meet with you, Jen? Good. Uh, Brad um, uh, and, and Jennifer, uh, uh, Brad, is Jennifer a new hire to, uh, to uh, this position? She was not, no. She was actually doing chemical dependency assessments prior to moving into this position. Okay, okay. So the, the, um, um, this is kind of a this is kind of a different role than for her um, in doing adult mental health assessment, uh, correct? I would say the role in the jail is a little different than the one she had before. However, I think some of the individuals she's been she worked with in the past have some of the same challenges she's working with now. So it was a really good fit to move her into this position when she indicated interest. Um, and given the fact, as you can see, just the number of individuals who have yep. had chemical dependency issues that have come through the jail, I think jail staff would, would certainly indicate history shows a, number, a lot of those folks do have chemical dependency challenges that have come through the jail. Um, uh, the, uh, you know, obviously there's, uh, she's logged a lot of work in a short period of time and a and number of successes there to share on the, um, on the screen. So I'm just curious about um, uh, training for, for Jennifer to, to do this work in this position, if this was something that, uh, um, that uh, your department invested the time to, uh, uh, and resources to give her the proper training to do this, or is this something that she had in her in her uh, backpack uh, uh, previously in in uh, being able to fulfill this role? You know, that's a good question. I'll start. Penny may want to add to it, but uh, you know, we knew that because this was a Region Five program, we wanted to get these staff to work together and have some similar information. And so as Penny said, she went to Crow Wing and Aiken County. Um, and I think it's always a challenge when you bring people into new roles in social services, whether they're new employees or whether they're experienced in moving into a new position is training both prior and on the job. Um, but I would also say that given her role in chemical dependency, which was about two and a half years, three years, something like that, I think really positioned her to move into this position. Mm -hmm. um, and so I don't know if you want to add any more, Penny, in terms of the training and experience she received. So she did maintain the Rule 25 um, education that's required. And in that Rule 25, there is a section that um, assesses for mental health. So the assessment in general is somewhat similar in that it applies both to mental health and chemical dependency. She is attending on the next week, 26th, uh, co-occurring um, mental health, chemical dependency, six hour training, as well as I sat with her myself um, as we did a few of the first couple screenings and as a LICSW, I was able to provide her some of that ongoing clinical supervision for that mental health aspect of it. I think the other nice thing about her in this position is she's also part of the adult unit, which includes mental health and chemical dependency staff, and she also attends, our, attends the prescription drug task force meetings at the hospital. So again, when you talk about the collaboration that occurs, you can't do this work, especially in the jail, in a vacuum, that you need the outside expertise because you need to understand how to deal with a variety of individuals. And so 
as well as the relationship she has with the jail staff. And, you know, she really didn't talk about that in terms of the integration in the jail, but the jail was very good in integrating her into that system um, with, you know, communication strategies, uh, laptops. We're actually wiring the jail uh, to help with uh, wireless technology uh, through the initiative. I think that's still a goal. Maybe not, still, but it was. Still in the works. <laughs> still in the works. Okay, so maybe it's not a go anymore, but that was the plan as well. But So I think it's been a variety of, of you know, things that have happened to integrate her into this position. So, and, and as Penny said early on, it's been a collaboration that's been real positive. Uh, and so I don't know if Scott and Tim, we can open it up to them a little bit. I know Scott provided a little bit of information for this report as well. It's been it's been great for the jail. Uh, staff doesn't buck it at all. It's, 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 I think staff's working very well with it. We've seen a lot of less stress on the inmates, which makes a lot less stress on staff. Uh, we got phone calls last week that Mille Lacs County is now currently in the process of hiring a social worker for their jail, and Cass County is in the process of hiring. So they reached out to both Jen and I for information, job descriptions, etc. Tim works with her side by side. They share the same office. It's pretty cramped quarters up there. So <laughs> it, uh, for both of them doing separate jobs, it, they're working real well together. If uh, Tim needs to step out of the office, he'll step out of the office. If Jen needs to step out of the office, she'll step out of the office. If it's something confidential that somebody needs a one-on-one -on -one with. Uh, the only thing we're looking at is after the project remodeling project's done, if there's some leftover cubicles that we might be able to uh, bring back to our office with. So give us more privacy that way that'll work for us. But otherwise, I think it's great. I'm glad we did it. Uh, I haven't heard one bad complaint yet. Commissioner Jelinski. Mr. Chair, Scotty, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but did you guys actually physically go down to Blue Earth and, and see how their operation was run? Just did through conversation, paperwork, and such as conversation. Uh, we met up in Brainerd. We talked to the social worker up there. We went up there for yeah. We did physically go to Crow Wing County because they had started their program. The you know the information that I've received personally from Blue Earth is this is an amazing program. Maybe not the first day, the first week, the first year, the whatever, but that it becomes to be truly an amazing program. And I, gotta, I have to be honest with you, I have to take my hats off to all of you for, for this. This is, a, this is truly, I think, a big deal. Whomever it is that comes into jail, whether it be for a day, two days, three days, a, a week, a month, a year, whatever it might be, I would hope to high heaven that when they leave, especially through this program, that when they leave, they're actually leaving a better person. I mean, it, it, that becomes a win-win for everybody. So thank you all very much for this. Jen, Jen's getting some eye openers on some of the stuff that we have to do. She's going through some of our training that we run our in-house staff through use of force just for self-protection up there. We never know if so. And that's the same we've told her. If you're uncomfortable with an inmate up there, let one of us know. If Tim's not there, one of us will stay there, stand outside the door. She's not alone. Or we'll move her down into her conference room where she has direct vision from master control. So. Anything else, gentlemen? I just would like to say thank you to uh, the short time that you've been implementing this. It's, there's been great results. Um, of course, there's going to be bumps in the road, I'm sure. And when, when that happens, we'll learn from them and move forward. But I want to thank every one of you and the sheriff for, for coming up with this idea and Penny for collaborating with everybody to create this thing. It's it's a good thing for, for those with chronic mental illness and and those with chemical dependency. Just one thing, it looks like, can make a difference, whether it's financial, housing, um, rehab, what, what have you. And uh, it's a great thing. Thanks. I want to thank you, too. I won't repeat what these two gentlemen said, but I, I want to thank you for everything you've done. And Penny has more information on our Delmont Hall initiative, which she's going to talk about. But I would like to say, too, that part of our innovation funding is going to continue to build upon this program to source well. So we're going to try and get some more grant funds to continue to build this program, both from a technology standpoint, uh, probably mostly from a technology standpoint. Mm -hmm. So. 
All right. So if you go to Thank page you. one of this, and if, if law enforcement wants to hang around, they're welcome to, but Penny wants to just provide some more information on what else the initiative has been up to. They've had a very busy year, especially just showing what we've done with the uh, reentry program, so. Is it this? No. no. Keep going up, 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 up. I'm getting there, my finger's not there. that oh, fast. Oh. There. there. <laughs> so the adult mental health initiative, just to kind of remind you, built um, consisting of Cass, Growing, Aiken, Morrison, Todd, Wadena, and then two um, tribal associations with the Mille Lacs Band and the Leech Lake Band. Um, this is a DHS grant funded initiative. So the first chart there that you're going to see is our 2018 grant budget. Um, the counties and tribes, we also have three consumer representatives that sit on our on our executive committee. Um, every year we go through our budget and we look at our gaps in our services across the region and what do we need to do to fill those. Um, so the CRE program was one way. We have some ongoing things that we're doing, um, some crisis support services with our um, mobile crisis outreach and crisis line, um, ACT services that we support, community education and prevention. Um, we've hired a transition specialist. So you know when we talk about the individuals that are committed and going to NOCA or uh, CBHH, um, when they're deemed medically clear to leave there. It costs the county about $1,400 a day if they're not actually released. So the initiative thought, gosh, we need to support this to be able to find them the appropriate place. We don't want them to leave a hospital setting when they're not safe to do so, but we also don't want to be pay paying $1,400 a day if they're able to leave the hospital. So we've hired a transition specialist to be able to support the case managers in really doing that in a timely, safe, appropriate manner. Um, that was a project that we really had just started back in 2017. The other service that is um, unique to Region 5 is our intensive community transition services. We contract with two providers to kind of provide a souped up arms service to individuals. Um, this means that they can have mental health supports and services um, as frequently as they need it at times of transition, maybe from that hospital setting to the community, um, or if there is an, in another type of crisis type situation, instead of just having arms which maybe only comes once a week. We know that when people are in a significant need, once a week really for one hour is not going to support them in the manner that they do. So we've contracted, we've created this service for our region. We've contracted with Northern Pines and Nystrom's to provide this service. Their response time is typically within 24 hours to get someone connected to the service where arms, you can have wait lists for two weeks to six weeks or beyond. Um, so just another service that shows how our region really looks at uniquely identifying our gaps and filling those gaps with services and supports with the funding that our grant allows us to do. Some of those general grant dollars, um, maybe before I move on, just to say in, in 2018 we've spent 96% of our budget that we were allowed um, and awarded of that $1,446,441. We spent 96% of that budget. Um, in 2019 our grant was reduced slightly just because of available funds from the state down to 1,236,000 about. So we did reduce some of our budget areas for crisis, stabiliz crisis stabilization and transportation. However, we increased them for housing, and here's why. I, I'm sure that you have heard much about our project that we're doing up in Crow Wing County as a regional initiative, um, the supporting supportive housing project that is going to um, hopefully break ground here in 2019 and begin operating in 2020. It's going to have 40 beds in it, um, 20 of them to be available as one bedroom apartments for individuals with mental health. 
and then the other 20 um, would be two or three bedroom units for families. This again was a, a regional initiative to really look at housing is consistently a shortage and an issue for people who are challenged by mental health. Penny, if I may, yeah. when these, uh, these housing Will somebody from Hennepin County be able to be recommended to come up here and use it to fill them up if we can't? Oh, that's a great question. And I don't know that we could say no, but I know that we have created some really good partnerships with the project has a housing um, manager as well as a service. We've um, contracted with Nystrom's to be the service provider in there. Um, just in talking throughout our, our six counties, we know that we pretty much could have this place filled up be, before it's ever even opened, um, just to fill our needs, which is why we're building it. Right. So can I say that nobody from Hennepin will ever end up there? I can't say that, but I do know that we are very um, strategic in how we are continuing to push this project forward. Thank you. Mr. Chair Penny, yeah. who owns this building? Who builds this building? Who pays for this building? Um, so Central Minnesota Housing Partnership is who we have contracted with um, to, to do that building and management of the project. Um, as far as actually owning it, it there's a... Okay. I guess I should just stop there. Yeah. Does the county own it? Does the state own it? Is it owned by a private individual? Private, Thank yes. You. Thank you. So that's another really big project that we were pushing through in 2018, and we were really excited that the we were awarded um, the, the funds to be able to do that with the White Oak Estates, um, really going to, to be built, breaking ground in 2019 now and starting in 2020. Um, some other things that the Adult Mental Health Initiative is consistently doing is we have stakeholder meetings every quarter. Um, people are, are able to come to those and learn about what's going on within our region, what services are out there. Um, the website uh, launched in January of 2018, a new website. Um, and that really has worked well for having really good consistency with resources and an event calendar. It really makes no sense for us here in Morrison to host a training that has 10 people and Crow Wing to host that same training that has 10 people and Todd County to host that same training. So really being more collaborative and, and that has just worked really well. I did put in here underneath that regional transition specialist that I talked a little bit about some of the dollars, um, both for our region as a whole, as well as Morrison County. So if you look in 2016, there were uh, 1,181 days that people were in a state hospital, ANOCA or CBHH, that they did not meet medical criteria, meaning they were medically cleared to go but not safe or having a stable place to go to to be appropriate back into the community. Um, you see that that number has dramatically dropped since we have implemented the transition specialist. Um, the dollars in 2017, 2018 as a whole for our region have dropped. Um, and here at Morrison, I think we've, we've gone up and down a little bit, um, but we continue to be lower than what we were in 2016 as well. Mr. Chair? Penny, I got a question to back up a little bit to that housing. Yes. You have 20 beds for mental health uh, people. Yes. And then you have 20 for families. Is this families with mental health? Is they, absolutely, they could have mental health. Um, all of the units, though, need to fall within that low income range. I, I just guess that I, I'm thinking if you have mental health, 20 of them with mental health problems, and now you've got families there, mm -hmm. is there some coordination between that that uh, 
What's my question? Yeah, so the beauty of it is is that we're going to have, um, it's a supported housing setting. So we have Nystrom's, who is our contracted provider, who's going to provide and be on site with mental health services. So they will physically be located, or have someone located at the site to offer mental health services and supports at any time. Thank you, and that was my question, at any time. Mm -hmm. Very good. We did offer two community education um, sessions in 2018, motivational interviewing and secondary trauma. Um, we did a really comprehensive look at our, at our outcomes and contracts with the providers that we have to make sure that we are filling the gaps how we want them to be filled um, instead of just contracting with people to provide something and not assuring that we're actually filling the gap like we needed to. So that was another big project we did in 2018 as well as the comprehensive reentry project that we've talked about. So really looking into 2019, a couple key things that we're looking forward to doing um, is really kind of reinitiating that tribal contact that they've had some staffing changes in both tribes and that has made it um, challenging for us to really get their, their input and make sure that they're a full member of our, of our group here. We will continue with the support of housing, planning and development. Um, we are looking to update our regional mental health services survey. The CRE program will expand to all six counties. I know Todd and Wadena and Cass are currently all in close stages of what that's going to look like in their counties. And then the last and, and something that's going to come up pretty quickly here is the vitals program. What this is, is this is an app that an individual can go and create a profile out on the internet and law enforcement, each will have an app and when a person would come in contact within a certain distance of law enforcement, their app pings up to the law enforcement's phone. And this can be for anybody. This is not just for someone who has incredibly chronic mental health. It could be physical health. It could be a developmental disability, um, a, a child for some reason. So I may put a profile up there. And for me, I may say, you know, I work at social services. I'll be a great resource for you in a crisis, whatever it may be. But a person can go out there and put anything that they want to on their profile. It's their profile. If they need to say, law enforcement, I am scared of you. Don't come up fast to me. Or I am deaf. Don't come up behind me. Make sure you're walking to the side of me so I can see you. Um, it, it really is just a safety feature and allows law enforcement to be able to engage people in the way that they want to be engaged so that the whole encounter is as successful as it can be. So, anything else? Just one comment that this is actually, we were offered this for a year free as a pilot because it does cost to have this app. Both the Sheriff's Department and Little Falls Police Department have agreed to um, to run this app on a trial basis for the year um, to see if it does work because we're not sure yet how many people will put a profile out there, how well it will work for law enforcement. So really this is a one year pilot project. Uh, between vitals, the mental health initiative, and law enforcement. I think each county in Region 5 is going to pilot a few yes. uh, police officers, both in the sheriffs and their local PDs. Um, and so um, we're just, it's one of those things that, again, just law enforcement willing to try something new as they interact with the public. Um, so, well, Mr. Chair, it, can I ask a question? It's, it's for your, your clientele, your mental health clientele that have case managers that would require that interaction it's not it's for anybody so anybody I'm, in the public i'm a criminal and i can put a profile out there to say law enforcement i'd rather you not come and visit me here how does that work do you have that profile no, no i mean i'm just trying to get like the, yeah. is that the the goal is more it's, it's more of a health focus okay yeah that's why we need to figure out how profiles yeah, how are put really up there how it comes through in law enforcement right. 
Interesting. I've never heard of anything like that. All right. Last thing that I have here is just um, part of the regional budget gets dispersed to individual counties, and you'll see in the graphs there um, how they have been dispersed within Morrison County for 2018 and how I have them budgeted in 2019. Housing, again, always our largest, our largest support area need that we have. Um, flex funds. Just to give you an idea of some things that that, that may be used for, medications, clothing, um, personal needs of some sort that may come up, medical equipment, things that are not covered by insurance or maybe their insurance is left and now they don't have their psychotropic meds in and it would be helpful for them to be taking their medications as prescribed. Um, so that flex area is really to meet any physical, mental health, or medical basic needs for a person. Funding comes from DHS? It's through that Adult Mental Health Initiative grant. So part of it we have chunked out to give each county an allocation. Mm -hmm. Any more comments or questions for Penny? So you can see they've had a busy year in the, in, in the initiative area with these six counties. So really appreciate the work Penny's done yeah, Penny. collaborating and the work she does with the other counties. And then just thank you to our law enforcement partners for coming today as well to share information. Thanks, thank Penny, you. for all thank you. you Thank you. Thank you, Penny. Thank you. All right, and then I have uh, two food, beverage, and lodging. The first is a food, beverage, and lot lodging license for change in ownership for Lucky Saloon in Swanville, formerly Red's Irish Pub, and, for, uh, and it has a new owner. So looking for a new establishment owner license. I'll ask for a motion. So move, Mr. Chair. Second, please. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any more discussion? Not those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. And then along with that, we need a new tobacco license, given the fact they have a new owner. So also have a, a board action for a new tobacco license for Lucky Saloon in Swanville. General, I'll ask for a motion. So, so moved, Mr. Chair. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any more discussion? Pardon? Jeff was, Jeff was. Wait a minute. Sorry. <laughs> Aye. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> 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 wow, where did that go? <laughs> <laughs> All right, motion carried. How about we take a five? Five. All right. <laughs> you are done, Brad. Right? I am done, yeah, yes, okay. sir. Thank you. Oh. You guys, so, so you guys get emails from Greg Smith too. So everybody's bragging to me that you have a there's a big thing coming up for you this like year. No more. My wedding. There we go. <laughs> Yeah, it's just ridiculous. Who's just talking about that to me? Uh, I was down in the cities at the extension. Oh, yeah. She's got her wedding huh? planning for it. Planning, planning, planning. Good morning, Katie. Good morning. What do you have for us, Katie? Well, um, if you don't know me, I'm Katie Winslow. I serve as your horticulture, small farms, and local foods extension educator. Um, extension right now, we're getting kind of wrapping up the winter conference season. Uh, January for me was extremely busy. We had the Minnesota Organics Conference, the Minnesota Fruit and Vegetable and Farmers Market Conference. Um, I also went down to New Orleans for a Farm Bureau Conference. Um, and then I have been working with a lot of local community groups who are interested in partnering both with Extension and local Extension Master Gardener organizations to uh, do some community gardens and uh, student youth gardens this summer. So we're in the process of beginning those conversations and figuring out how we can have a partnership with those organizations. All right. You have, I'm looking at your events for this for February. Well, we're almost three fourths through February, <laughs> ready? But yeah, you got. It looks like everybody will be busy in March too, huh? Yep. March will be another busy month. Um, up here in March, I am planning a fruit and vegetable uh, workshop for management and pests. So I have two speakers coming in who both work with Extension. Uh, we'll be talking about disease or 
management practices or mismanagement practices that end up looking like diseases and how we can uh, fix those issues as well as common uh, bug and insect problems and how to work with those in your fruit and veg production system. So we'll be meeting in this room um, here in Little Falls in the morning on the 27th and then we'll be taking that program to Douglas County um, I'm working with another extension educator from that area to do the same program in the afternoon. Any questions for Katie at all? Comments? Seems like Katie's been busy. Yeah, Trying to be. <laughs> And how are you liking your job? It's great. Having Good. a lot of fun with it. I'm um, trying to keep up with things. I am uh, being a little more active than some of my predecessors on social media. So if you guys want to follow those things, you're more than welcome. Uh, I know Jeff follows me on Twitter, but I also have a Facebook page specifically for this job. Um, you're more than welcome to follow those as well. Anything else? Thank you, Thank you, Thank you for your work. Thanks, Katie, awesome. very much. Thank you. And I see Chelsea's here. How are you doing, Chelsea? I'm good. How are you guys? Good. Good, good morning, Chelsea. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Nice outfit, Chelsea. I like the red and black. Thanks. <laughs> I look my best. <laughs> Very stylish. All right. A couple things I have today. So first I have um, the engagement letter from the auditors the state auditors. So today I'm looking for the approval of the audit engagement letter. This is both for Morrison County and for Morrison County RDFA to be approved. I'll ask for a motion, gentlemen. I'll make a motion. Second for more discussion. We had a second from Mr. Wilson. Second. Any yeah. more discussion? If not, those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Um, I do have one thing to follow along with the audit engagement letter. So um, once the approval is set, then we have um, looking in the future the audit entrance meeting with the state auditors. And I'm looking at a date of March 19th following the planning session. And I know I spoke with Randy, um, and he'll be out of town. But Commissioner I do know Lemire will be in charge. Yes. I just want to make sure that that works. Is that okay with you, yeah. Commissioner? I would suggest having Randy be here about 10.30 um, following the planning session. I don't know what's going sure, to be on I'll the be agenda yet. I'll be here in mind, just not body. Oh, <laughs> it's not so bad. <laughs> well, on the 19th, I'm not going to be here in March. So, so on March 19th, okay. if we could just have that following the planning session, but maybe tell Randy... Um, Randy, the oh, Randy boy. Choice. Sorry, sorry. Know, that's why you're. I, you're saying, I was Randy, confused too. Telling me, I'm going, going. Boy, you're really informing me no, on this one. No, no. Randy Randy's boy. Our the, yes, yeah. yes. Sorry, that's okay. why it's confusing. But we'll do that right now. It wasn't after. that confusing. Uh -huh. It wasn't. I, it was confusing to me in a second. I'm going, thanks, Deb. Okay, perfect. So that should work. <laughs> do you want to let Steve know? Yes. It's good to have a little humor. Anything else? We all, you're, yeah, you guys are okay with that, right? We'll work it. We only need uh, Mike here. That's it. Everybody's right? welcome to attend, no, but yeah, we need to, to have Mike. Oh, that's that one. That's the yes. one. Yeah, it's the entrance. The exit is so a bit other, more you guys formative, but I like it when you all are there. You guys know how that works. Yep, gotcha. All right. Okay, we got that taken care of finally. Chelsea, I may, if I may ask a question, sure. we, we're, we're going with the state auditor's office, right? Wasn't there wasn't uh, something changed yeah. where we you could, could go pick. privately and stuff? That and is we correct. Never, and we never have done that. Correct. So okay. this is, we are going with the office and the state auditors, but we can always have, we always have that option right. to go elsewhere if we wish. We've had a good experience with them. Um, it's uh, something at some point in time, maybe once, um, you know, once in a couple of years we could do an RFP or kind of see where we'd be at with pricing that. But we really had a good experience. You have the same folks coming back. It makes things run a little smoother sometimes, but we certainly can go look elsewhere if you'd want to at some point in time. I probably, again, we'd want to plan that out a little bit in terms of what. I guess my point yeah. was that there's probably been people that have done it for one or two years now. It'd be interesting to see when you're at a convention somewhere. Did they find a big difference? I've Did heard mixed reviews, actually. We've talked about it in yeah. our in the administrator circle. Some 
really didn't have good experience with Office of State Auditors, so they were looking to go yep. elsewhere, um, and that's kind of what prompted some of that initially. Um, we have always had good experience, so I guess I can't relate to specifically to that, but some have gone out and have had good experience, some have gone out and have gone back, so it varies. Very for sure. Thank you. You know, Mr. Chair, I, I certainly won't speak for Chelsea, but and I won't speak for Steve either, but I will kind of echo what Steve has said in the past, is that exactly what you said. They send the same people all the time, and you have a working relationship with them. However, that being said, I'm not opposed to eventually one day going out in an RFP simply to see if we're in the general price range. Mm -hmm. And I can't help but believe that a private auditor and the state auditor are going to differ a great deal because there's more to it than just the bottom line but when we're, when we're doing it that way, as far as I'm concerned. Well, if, and if we a had a discussion on this here many, many times, and a big thing is they can still be audited. The state oh. can still audit this auditor. You know, it's kind of like, well, this way we just eliminate the middleman, you know. So. Exactly. All right, Chelsea. And I see you've got some uh, approval for some licenses in here, huh? Yeah, so I'm looking for approval of the following permits. exempt permits that we have and also an off-site gambling permit. So we have um, a permit for Morrison County Ducks Unlimited to hold a raffle at the Falls Ballroom on April 26th. We also have an exempt permit uh, to Bethan Bethany Lutheran Church of Ramsey to hold a bingo Rainy. at the church hall. Rainy, right? Ramey, yes. Ramey. Thank you for the correction. And then an off-site gambling permit to the Minnesota Fishing Museum to hold a fundraiser at the Falls Ballroom on April 12th. Gentlemen, I need a motion for all three permits, please. So move. Do I, need, I have a motion and a second. Any more discussion? Not those in favor? All right. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Motion to pay the bills? <laughs> all of them? Not, not quite. Are we not um, next, we have the cash report. Oh. For January and I know um, from last month we had the discussion to bring this forward on a quarterly basis yes. however by law um, we do have to have a cash report monthly oh. to show the cash on hand every month so this will be brought to board every month and then we'll have the quarterly reports the additional reports that I brought last month sounds good excellent thank you any more discussion on the cash report? Now you can no. do it. Mr. Chair, no. I would make a motion that we pay all of the bills, and the emphasis would be on all of the bills. All right. Do I have a second? Second. Any more discussion? This is a roll call vote. Commissioner Lemire. Aye. Commissioner Wilson. Aye. Commissioner Blaine. Aye. Commissioner Zelensky. Aye. Myself is aye. Motion carried. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chelsea. Chelsea, have a good day. Thanks. You guys you too. With everything, Chelsea? I am. That's it. <laughs> really kind of run you out sometimes. <laughs> and who yes. do we have out here in our audience? We have people who are going to go after me if we want. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> we have to get the police department here to help you out. No. Sheriff's department, are they going after you no. or what? No, I was just going to quickly go through this and then follow the agenda. But if you want to deviate from oh, the agenda. Oh, it says account. building project update. I'm right following. after the administrator's report. Oh, I'm sorry. I but crossed you all. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I thought you were done. <laughs> this is how What's it goes. The, the, the I have a couple of board it? action items. One is in the packet. Um, the appointment for Board of Adjustment member Russ Nigren for District 1. 2019 through 2021, and a planning commission member, Earl Fickman, District 5, Josh Rosinski, District 5 alternate, Clint Catherine, District 1 alternate. Gentlemen, I need a motion. Second. Motion and a second. Any more discussion? Those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Sorry about that, Deb. I just That's all right. I'm used to it. Used to be in um, yes. In your area. The other. Agenda item, or the action item that I need before the building construction update uh, would be for the community land solutions contract. I didn't get a copy into the board packet prior to because I, I was out and I got that from, from Scott. The adjustment that was made following our discussion last week was in the termination clause. Let me find it quick. For the contract may be terminated 
terminated prior to the end of the term with or without consent by either party. That was the change that was requested. Um, I spoke with Brian about it, and this meets the needs, at least, that you had identified last week. So that change is in there. Um, my request for action would be to approve the contract and to place um, Scott in effect March 1st. We would be bringing to you an official appointment with the oath on the 12th of March. But I'd like to get going with that. The re recommendation would be for four half days per month based upon the discussion. Gentlemen, we had a discussion on this. I'll ask for a motion for more discussion. So moved. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. I have a motion and a second. Any more discussion? Just one little tiny bit of discussion so I am reading it correctly. Termination is by either party on a 30-day notice. Mm -hmm. Very good. Thank you. And if you if you would, Deb, just can you describe the what this Position. will be doing for us and all the departments that they will assist in helping out? Please. Yep, we had we spoke last week and and went through kind of a list of needs or services that can be filled. Um, I didn't bring that document with me here, but I have it from last week. The, um, but, you know, a lot of the land offices really interact with components that this individual and that license or that, that professional license can help with. Um, land transfers, a lot of the documents within the recorder's office that facilitate a land transfer are somewhat technical um, in nature and how that process works and whether or not they're correct um, is important to have verified. Private surveyors who do work within the boundaries of Morrison County rely on uh, this position to really help guide when it comes to section corners, like the points of where they're starting their surveys, making sure that, that folks are starting in the same place and we have a, a, as clean of possible as a pre, of a presentation of those section corners in that public land survey grid. Um, the s public works area, Steve spoke at length about the need to have this profession um, incorporated into their road project um, to really acquire right of way and have that described properly. We've been doing our best, but no, we can do a lot better when it comes to that process. Um, Amy's Office in Land Services talked a lot about the skill to be able to differentiate what's on paper when it comes to descriptions, what we assess for um, when it comes to those descriptions, how discrepancies can occur, and where to start on trying to correct and remedy some of that, I think is important. Um, also talked a lot about delineations and about descriptions with delineations. Chelsea's office talked a lot about land splits and about um, documents that come in, either surveys that come in or other documents that come in that are splitting property and about really having that um, professional look at ramifications that could come into play or if it's correct and things of that nature. It talked about ditch, uh, reading ditch assessment descriptions and how over time since they were first identified as being determined property back in the early 1900s and how splits and transitions and all of that has occurred over time and about how we can get a clean list of, of that and helping us really decipher some of that. It's all very technical um, in terms of property descriptions and about how they transcend over time and making sure we're correct with those and having that skill set to be able to bring all of that together and making sure any of those land offices that are doing work that kind of touch the geography of Morrison County kind of are tied together in a way that helps advance our records, helps advance our processes to really set things up um, in the future correctly. Is that good? And uh, yeah, it's a great explanation. <laughs> Thank you. Mr. Chair, uh, uh, if I may, uh, this is a one-year agreement, correct? Um, yes. So this will go to to March, or or are we looking to align this with the calendar uh, year at all? Um, it, does that have any effect uh, as far as uh, budgeting or anything like that? No, we're utilizing, recommending to utilize funds out of the recorder's compliance fund, which is an incredibly appropriate and good use of those dollars that are that accumulate every year to really try to advance our property records system. Um, I would recommend March to March. I, I don't think that we need to have it in the calendar year at this point in time, so I'm comfortable with that. Okay. Um, we need to get a start on it, I think, just to develop that relationship to really learn um, how uh, Scott and his services can really be incorporated into the business that we do and how we can advance and, and make service better. Call question. And uh, 
Uh, this was also brought up last week that you know that he reports to you to so give us the information mm -hmm. what he's doing with his time mm -hmm. and again yep, absolutely I'm sure we all agreed to that too so yeah some of his time will be spent in front of you to really talk and um, identify to you what it is that we're doing what it is that um, he potentially could add to any expanded services beyond um, what's included in the base contract would be would be vetted and would be talked about in terms of what that would bring for results Thank you. So, so, Mr. Chair, so then uh, uh, for clarification, so will, uh, will uh, Mr. Marlin be the um, presenting to this board or, or, or who will be the one that will be communicating uh, his activities to this board? I think both. Um, he will be here on the 12th if this moves forward to be sworn in, to be identified and as the county surveyor. And then beyond that, I think he would be appropriate to come in front of the board to talk to you. Um, and that would be part of the base contract or um, I can relay that. I think both, a combination of both would occur moving forward. Okay. Mr. Chair, Commissioner Blaine, that was one of my concerns or one of my wishes Mm -hmm. uh, during discussion and at planning meetings, of course, was, was, was exactly that. Now, I don't, my, my position is I don't need to see that man once a month to come in here and say, oh, guess what I've been doing? But I think it's important, especially being a new service, is that the right term? I'm not sure, a new service that the county has now or will have or would have just to at least see how this thing is working. I, I just don't want it to go one year down the line, oh, here's another bill. Well, what, what have we done? I, I, that's what I'm kind of looking for and myself. keep in mind, Mr. Chair, that, that Scott's email and phone contact is beyond just that half a day. So there are questions that come up that I know you have from your constituency that he will absolutely be open to talking directly with you and making sure that um, we get answers to questions that are out there when it comes to section corner issues or how um, folks' property, you know, if they have different questions with assessment versus documented property, things of that nature all can be addressed and he can speak to that much better than anybody we have right now. I'll just say then that we'll look forward to that uh, communication between this board and uh, Mr. Marlin here over the next year and, uh, and uh, the work that he that he'll be doing too. So, and to verify, this is a one-year contract, not a one-year, one day. It's a one-year contract, and then at that time, we all have to decide whether we move on or yep. uh, get out of the. I anticipate prior to March 1st of next year, we'll be talking about continuation and not or non-continuation. Yep. yep. Mr. Chair. This isn't really anything new. It's new with Scott, mm -hmm. but we have put $25,000, I think, the last two, three, four years for surveyors to do work for us and to find things. Am I not correct on that? Mm -hmm. But we haven't utilized it. Because That's right. There but wasn't we had put the money aside yeah. for that. Yeah. We have, I, you know, we had hoped for regular office yep. hours, and that was something that didn't ever come yep. to fruition. Again, Scott's really concentrating on municipality work. It really worked yep. directly for the greater public, not for individuals as much. And so I'm hoping that this. Um, a uh, contract really can provide what it is we were looking for all along, um, which is having a dedicated public focus uh, option for for Morrison County. Good, Anything you. else? Gentlemen, I have a motion and a second. Any more discussion? If not, those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. All right. Now. <laughs> the Come building on construction the update. Congratulations, Mr. Chair, you got yourself a survey. <laughs> a lot of good have done me to vote against it, because I have all you four on the day. Thanks. Thanks for that. Sure. Someone said no. Hi. Oh, are we going to really. <laughs> yeah, she really hopes because I will definitely remind her of this one. See, Mr. Chair, uh, while we're uh, while we're waiting for our paperwork here, um, I want to I want to thank uh, personally thank uh, uh, Pete and Mike for the time that they took uh, 
uh, with us, and, uh, and especially with me and the, uh, the tour we had here two much. weeks ago um, of, the, uh, of the progress down in the, uh, in the courthouse there. And I was, uh, I was very grateful for the time they took to explain. I know it was quite some time. Yeah. It was. It was. <laughs> it was. I almost had to camp. But, uh, but uh, no, it was, uh, they took a long time for them to educate this uh, commissioner. And so I was, I was very grateful. So thank you. Yes. Philippi boys can be pretty chatty. They take a lot of time. <laughs> I'm a man of very few words. Pete, what yes. do you got for us? Boilers. Good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the board. Uh, I see Deb had a few pictures oh, yeah. up here of the building committee uh, tour that we took a few weeks ago. And once again, thank you for attending. It kind of gives you a better insight of what's actually happening primitive fixture. Uh, on the job site and just kind of keep you apprised of the progress. Um, if you look at the overall budget, which kind of goes along hand in hand with the pictures, uh, the money that has been spent thus far, the contractors based a little over $6.1 million, a little over $4 million has been already expended. Uh, a large part of that is due to the fact that we have the roofs on the building and a uh, major expense of this project is the mechanical plant. Uh, what you see in the pictures is pretty much all installed and up and running in the case of the boilers. Uh, we still have a few air handling units and so things like that, but uh, for the most part, the major expenses uh, have been expended and uh, currently in place and up in operation. So, uh, looking through the budget contingency line item, uh, you have a balance remaining in there of 246000 uh, general conditions still sitting healthy right now with a balance in there of 566000 considering where we're at with the overall project. Uh, any questions on the budget? What is the general condition line item for again? That takes care of your dumpsters, uh, the temp heaters, the air cleaners we have currently running, those day-to-day -day operations, building permit, plan printing, a variety of those items, builder's risk insurance. Mr. Okay. Chair? Pete, you see the numbers and, and, and you see these numbers daily, regularly, much more often than I, quite honestly. What do you think of these numbers? The numbers right now, uh, contingency-wise, uh, we're in good shape if it's for the construction remainder. Uh, some of these additional items that are coming before us to be incorporated in the project, some of that excess will need to be backfilled in, uh, and I'll get to that in a minute in the case of like the jail camera system. Uh, the only other line item that we had discussed prior to that we know is gonna have to probably require a little bit extra funding is the ff &E, the furniture line item. Okay. Construction and I wise, like I said, I think for the most part, uh, if that remains for construction only, we'll be in good shape, so. I can't and I won't um, put you on the spot about the change order items that are also in front of us, these two. That That's not what I'm talking about, really. No. I'm talking about subtract that. Get that out of your head. How does how do these numbers look to you? I, very healthy right now. Okay. I think we're in good shape. Very good. Thank you. Yep. Anything um, else for Pete? Keep going there, young man. Sounds good. Second page. Uh, brought two items to you for uh, consideration and approval. I'll just take them one by one. As you know, we've been working with the sheriff's staff in conjunction with our project to uh, replace and upgrade the existing cameras in the jail. Uh, since we have a new camera system going in with our base project, it made total sense to explore and look at that. So the past four or five months, we've been engaging in conversation to expand that into the jail system. Uh, I know at the building committee, we had a little highlighted plan uh, that was circulated on what's being accomplished with uh, this change. Basically what's happening is, is your existing jail cameras are over 25 years old. Uh, very poor quality, and as you know, that's one of the areas of your operation where you're at high risk of uh, whether it be an assault on a staff member, potential suicide, and we're seeing a major wave right now uh, across Minnesota uh, to upgrade cameras in these jails to a digital-based camera. Uh, it's basically taking your existing analog system and moving it to a digital system. Uh, with this price, we're changing out 71 cameras. Some are existing, going to be changed out with new digitals, and others are just new locations that were identified by the Department of Corrections. 
Hand in hand with this uh, change uh, would be the incorporation of interview recording systems for the Sheriff's Department. Uh, this will allow them to bring people in, uh, do their investigations, uh, and have a means to record those items. Basically, it's three different interview rooms that will uh, go back to a base unit where those uh, uh, video and audio are recorded. So. Uh, the price to upgrade is Holden Electric. Uh, the system is in a Vigilon system. It's a pretty recognized camera. And the price for the system is $219,406.86. Mr. Chair, not only will that bring the system into compliance with DOC standards, there are a few things that we need to update, but also it will help improve quality and retention of that data. And like Pete had said, our liability when it comes to what's going on in a jail with incarcerated folks is pretty high. And so making sure we have quality system in place that can document what it is we're doing um, can help protect us in the future if there's anything that does occur. Jim, we'll do these individually, so I would ask for a motion for the re upgrade the jail security camera system. Mr. Chair, I'm going to move on that. Do I have a second? Second. Any more discussion? This will be a roll call. Commissioner Jelinski? Aye. Commissioner Blaine? Aye. Commissioner Wilson? Aye. Commissioner Lemaire? Aye. Myself is aye. Motion carried. Boardroom. Item number two, boardroom AV system. Uh, what this PR, PR 34, was issued for was a couple different items. Uh, in short, it's to upgrade or basically provide new broadcast equipment for the county boardroom and the adjoining two conference room spaces. Uh, Alongside of that, uh, this new system will enhance your video archiving of meetings. Uh, at the same time, it's going to provide some more flexibility for the conference rooms that are adjoining the boardrooms, uh, meaning if the rooms need to be separated, presentations need to be handled individually, uh, it provides a little bit more flexibility for the space. Uh, along with that, it adds a couple security cameras within those spaces as well. So the major component, of course, is the new broadcast production equipment. I know there was some talk early on of whether or not it should have been included in the base project or not. Uh, and I guess I'll take part responsibility for that if it was I didn't anticipate it. We had the rough-ins early on. Um, but at the same time, this is what I would consider an added value. I think it'll... Uh, bode well for uh, the community that shows up, the public that shows up to these meetings as far as being able to see the information and a nice easy setup. Uh, they'll be able to hear well at these board meetings and at the same time you'll have the video side that could be fed out and as well as archived. So with that, uh, I know Deb's worked hard back and forth with the actual vendor of the system to make sure it fits the needs of Morrison County without a lot of frills. Uh, and it's $43,905. With that, I'll ask for a motion. So moved. Second? Do I hear a second? second? I have a motion to second. Any more discussion? Mr. Chair, one thing that I have heard from our prior boardroom, and I'm not saying one word about the city because we're, we're guests here, was that our audio system in our old facility was less than good. I'm anticipating, and based upon what Pete just said, this is something, this is the public's house, this isn't my house, or, or our new living arrangement, if you will, our new quarters. This is not mine, and it's not ours. This is the people's, and anybody that sits in the audience deserves, at the very, very least, to be able to hear clearly what takes place at any given board meeting. And thus, I, I will also support this. Sir. Mr. Blaine, um, uh, I just want to clarify the fact that you know we've talked about this um, um, at length at times, but I think the underlying um, uh, point of all of this is now is the appropriate time to, to do these two projects because um, uh, we're talking about laying a lot of wire or, or running a lot of cable and these things. Um, uh, uh, with the construction um, at the position it is right now, this is the appropriate time. We have the appropriate contractors there to do all this. It'll save us money to take this action now rather than 
down the road. So and thank you. Mr. Chair, the, the board room not only, as Commissioner Jelinski said, is set up for those that are present, but also those virtually who want to um, know what's happening, that we can broadcast it appropriately, that it's of high quality. Um, so I think that's important. And also not only for you as a county board, but the Board of Adjustments, the Planning Commission, all of the recording for Absolutely. those meetings to be conducted should be far better, um, more useful, more um, able to be researched and recalled when necessary. So all of that really brings a system up to date for the use that not only the public expects and should expect, but also that we need to provide when it comes to retaining um, data and making sure we have the information readily accessible when needed. Any more discussion, gentlemen? This will be a roll call vote. Commissioner Jelinski. Aye. Commissioner Lemire. Aye. Commissioner Wilson. Aye. Commissioner Blaine. Aye. Myself is aye. Motion carried. With that, I'll turn it over to Brother Mike here to give you a little update on schedule. Thank you, gentlemen. Thanks, Pete. Thank, Thank you. you. Pete. Morning. Morning. Morning, Morning, Mike. Morning. Uh, basically, uh, I know you're all there a couple weeks ago for a tour. Um, uh, since then, uh, we're just nearing the completion of all the drywall taping. Um, we're going to start painting yet this week, um, and we're going to start sealings in about a week and a half um, from the start of the painting. Um, overall, um, looking at cabinets mid to late March, and then we'll start flooring sometime uh, probably about the second week of April. So um, the next phase we're looking at completing by June. So, <laughs> Any questions for Mike? Thanks for the update, gentlemen. Okay. Committee reports. What day are we looking at, or we what weeks? We have three weeks because we have two planning sessions in a row. So we're going from February 24th, 24th. through March 16th. March. The week of our next board meeting. All right. How about we start with Commissioner Blaine? Give me a sec. All right. This time go by. So we've got uh, on the 26th planning session, um, we have a public works planning session on March 1st. Um, we have planning session on March 5th, is that correct? Mm -hmm. Um on uh, March 8th, I will have uh, another infamous South Country meeting um, <laughs> in Orotana. That's at 9. That is at 9. Um, uh, on March 10th, Daylight Savings Time will be here and we'll all be really happy. <laughs> um, uh, we have board meeting on, uh, on March 12th. Um, I see there's a department head uh, meeting, 13, and IT training on the 13th. Um, uh, there's a Morrison Todd Wadena Community Health Board meeting on scheduled for March 13th um, at 3 p.m. in Staples, and if I'm uh, if I'm correct, that's that's all I have. Do you have a Region 5 on the 28th? Of February for him? Mm -hmm. um, yes, I'm sorry. Okay. I'm, I had to scroll a little bit more, but thank, thank you um, uh, for that. You good to go? I am good to go, thank Commissioner you. Commissioner Jelinski. February 25th, 10 o'clock in the morning. I believe we all have an extension meeting in St. Cloud. And at 12 o'clock after that extension meeting, I've got a meeting set up with Katie Winslow, who was just here from extension. She wants to do some kind of an interview. Seven o'clock that evening, I believe we have a planning commission meeting. That was canceled. That's canceled. That's canceled. Yep. Thank you. Where is your interview with Katie? That's gonna be in St. Cloud at that extension room. Well, board meeting, that's for us three counties. 
That's the Tri County. Right. I'm sorry. That's the Tri County meeting. Yeah. So we. Are and I did have them send out an invitation to all yep. you guys. Good. And I did get it. On the 26th is our administrator's birthday. I can't forget that. On the 27th, I've got lunch on location at the chamber office with Hands of Hope as the sponsoring agency. On the 28th at 1230, I've got a state emergency communications board meeting in St. Paul. Do you have a 10 o'clock? Do I have a 10 o'clock? Ten and one at twelve thirty. Yeah, this was at twelve thirty. I'm sorry, okay. I didn't say the time. That's the one that that one is is in Saint Paul. Uh, a, on the fourth of March, there's a Morrison County Public Safety meeting at six thirty p.m. and that I believe is in the Public Health Library. I just saw when Katie was here with extension. On the 5th of March, there's a beef workshop in Royalton that usually I think is in the evening. Yeah. I, I've attended that several times before, but I don't think it's ever been in Royalton. And I, that's all the detail I have. I don't even know what time it is. On the 6th, at 11 o'clock in the morning, I've got an emergency services board meeting, central region, just and that's just an executive committee at 11 o'clock on the 6th in St. Cloud. On the 7th at 10 o'clock in the morning, I've got a state emergency communications board legislative conference call. That's at my house. On the 8th of March, there's actually a RAC meeting in Alexandria which I'm going to have to miss because I'm going to be speaking to Ryan Marowitz's driver's ed class in Royalton that that day. And go to the 16th. Go sir. through the 16th. On the 12th at noon, there's a toward zero death meeting. And that's at public health. On the 13th, I'm going to be back in Royalton at another driver's training class at Mr. Marowitz's room. I believe that's at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. On the 14th, there's a public safety conference call uh, regarding the conference that's coming up. That's at 1 o'clock in the afternoon. That's at my house. And on the 15th is the Morrison County Public Safety Banquet at Camp Ripley. And I believe that all of the board is invited to that. And that would be something that comes through public health. That's at 5 o'clock, and I believe it's at the hangar. What day is that on? At Camp Ripley. That's the 15th of March. 5 o'clock. I believe it's at 5 o'clock. Tickets or something? Yeah, you got it. You got no. I think you got to contact Emily at Public Health. That's on the fifteenth of March, and Mr. Chair, I believe that's all I've got. All right. Is there a trails meeting this month for March? Yeah, probably. <laughs> I would have had. I have found possibly for the fourteenth of March. Yep, I'm going to guess that's right. And that's at 7 o'clock or 7.30. I can't remember. You have it marked down by any chance? I can look back. Are they always the same? Yeah. Oh, yeah, I can look back. Sorry. Okay. And that's at the 4th? Actually, I'm wrong. It's a trails meeting. It's at 6 o'clock, and it's in Randall on the 14th. Are you good, Commissioner Zinski? Thank you. All right. Commissioner Lemire. I just got two to add. Yellow ribbon on the 11th, mm -hmm. 5, and Chamber of Commerce at the Chamber of Commerce on the 14th at 11. Commissioner Wilson. I take it on March 5th, Board of Adjustment. Was that canceled? Yes. Okay. Yes. One of my calendars says it's canceled. The other one doesn't. So that's all I've got. 
And this, um, I'm good other than, let's go back to on the 13th at Staples. Is that public health you said, or what is that? Who, who Jim, it? Or uh, Greg said it. Yeah, Greg, you're bringing up that there's, because we always have that one annual meeting every year. Is this the, the one? Key, is, are you talking about the... Uh, it's this Morrison is the Morrison Todd Wadena. The Tri-County uh, one. The Tri-County. That's the one we always we used to but go to. is that just no, a meeting no, or is that no. an annual? That's for that's for Greg and I. Okay. Yeah. Oh, that's, oh, I'm sorry. Because we, okay. All right. That, that, that's on the that's 13th. That's totally fine. All right. Yes. Then I'm good to go. Anything else, gentlemen? Can have a soil and water? <laughs> 28th? Oh, that's right. Yeah, I do. Oh. Actually, I don't. I have it on the 22nd. And then there was like a Wadena EMS night that was not. That's, oh, I, they, I thought I might have, might Wait, be. Keep us on our toes. I time. might be speaking at that one, but I don't think I am. All right, motion to adjourn. So moved. Second, do I need a second? I need this, I do need a, got a second. Motion carried. Yeah, I'm sorry, no, RDFA.